Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSEARCH, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby, we bring you Crumb Search from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Today we'll have a good look at um, a paper recently published in JAMA Surgery reporting the sleeve pass randomized clinical trial outcomes at 10 years. Uh, Professor Saba is then going to carry on his lectures on evidence-based medicine for surgeons and trainees. I'll leave you to it. Yeah, good evening, everybody. My name's Alistair Martin. I'm one of the um, uh, sort of CST1 equivalent trainees at Mid Yorks. Uh, currently working on general surgery alongside Geo, um, who, as you probably know, is one of the uh, registrars also in general surgery. And this evening, we're going to be speaking to you about uh, this paper here. So uh, the title is Effective Laparoscopic Sleeve Gastrectomy um, versus Rouen Y Gastric Bypass on Weight Loss, and then some of the obesity related comorbidities and reflux uh, at a 10 year. Um, sort of reflective look back at adults with obesity, uh, in pa adult patients with obesity. So this is the sleeve pass randomized clinical trial. This is actually the second time they've come back to it. This is the 10 year follow up, uh, which took place in Finland and concluded uh, this year, 2022, published in JAMA Surgery. OK, so. Uh... So a few words about the background for uh, this particular paper. Now, the sleeve pass trial has been um, quite popular for the past 10 years and has been used um, sort of as a, ever as a reference to determine the efficacy of laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy and uh, lap ruin y gastric bypass. Uh, and they've become the two most commonly performed procedure with sleeve gastrectomy uh, perhaps taking a lead in some countries. There's still a few unanswered questions that this paper and this 10 years follow-up try to kind of answer. One is uh, there has been increasing reports of high rate of gastroesophageal reflux, Barrett's esophagus, uh, and esophagitis in uh, uh, lap sleeve gastrectomy or sleeve gastrectomy in general, um, which does have repercussions, uh, as you can imagine. Um, we don't know for sure whether weight loss is maintained at 10 years, or I would say, beyond 10 years now. Um, and another big question is whether the comorbidities resolution, which have been sold as one of the main advantages of this surgical procedure, is actually maintained at 10 years and how good, um, how good it is, if it is a complete resolution or a partial resolution. So this is where kind of this 10 years report sits and what it tries to answer. So ball back to you, Alistair, for a bit more. Okay, so just to speak about the aims of the study, uh, it's quite interesting this. So initially, uh, what they outline as their target um, before they began the study was the the main one, which we've discussed there, is comparing the long term outcomes on weight loss, and they define this specifically as excess weight loss um, for these patients, uh, these obese patients with the BMIs above uh, forty or thirty five um, with comorbidities. Um, and the secondary objective, the main secondary objective they come to, is the remission of these obesity related comorbidities, which again we'll outline specifically later. The third aim which they come to, which is another secondary aim, um, is something, a sort of a conclusion they came to retrospectively having completed um, the, uh, the study uh, and having looked at the first two in that they found some uh, impact on the prevalence of gastroesophageal reflux, um, esophagitis and Barrett's esophagus, uh, the latter two being confirmed on a OGD for every patient. Um, but then, as we've mentioned, this is all uh, a 10 year follow up on patients comparing um, the gastric sleeve and room Y um, gastric bypass, both uh, completed laparoscopically. That's the reason you see the uh, rather stylish new stamp on there, because it's a, a sort of conclusions that they came to uh, ad hoc retroactively once they'd completed the study and not initially something that they had actually set out to do. Uh, but uh, Gio is going to tell us a little bit about the methods uh, of the study now. Yeah, so um, this is uh, designed as a multi-center, multi-surgeon, open-level equivalence a randomized control trial. Um, so the original setup was to determine the equivalence of laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy versus through NY. Uh, included patients or population, if you like to say it in a PICO way, uh, are adults uh, aged 18 to 60 with a BMI above 40 um, or above 35 with a significant obesity-related comorbidities, which are pretty much universal 
um, criteria for inclusion uh, in uh, um, bariatric surgery. And as you can see, there's a bunch of exclusion criteria that do make a reasonable sense. Um, very high BMI, so super obesity over 60, psychiatric disorders, um, uh, alcohol and substance misuse, previous bariatric surgery in presence of significant gastric ulceration or uh, uh, big hiatus hernias. Uh, we'll carry on a little bit and talk about um, our intervention and our control. So when this study was designed, the uh, mainstream uh, operation for obesity was LAPRO-NY. Um, and this is used as a control. So this, the trial is designed to determine whether uh, LAP gastric sleeve is actually equivalent in terms of weight loss um, to lapro and why because it was felt uh, that it was a less invasive procedure with less risks. Uh, so intervention is LGS and control is lapro and why. So ball to you now, Alistair. Yeah, so just a bit about the outcomes. So I touched earlier that their primary outcome was uh, the weight loss. That's what they were measuring. And they specifically use this formula to uh, determine the excess weight loss. So this is basically a brief formula. I won't go through it completely there, but it basically compares uh, their weight loss based on their ideal weight um, for their BMI as a percentage in terms of the weight they lost in the 10 years following the procedure. Then the secondary um, the comorbidities they were looking at, these obesity-related comorbidities, the ones they set out to look at uh, when the study was designed, was sleep apnea, um, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and then a quality of life, uh, specific quality of life score, and then broadly morbidity and mortality. The sort of reflux-based and subsequent consequence of reflux-based, so the reflux disease itself, the Barrett's esophagus and esophagitis, um, esophagitis and the use of PPIs is something they reflected on a bit later, um, but it does bring up some of the more interesting conclusions from this study. So then Jews can tell us a little bit about the results, uh, the conclusions they drew. Wonderful. So uh, wheezing through this wonderful chart. So as you can see, uh, at the start of the trial, they had 240 patients uh, randomized uh, as based on their uh, sample size calculations, uh, which I mentioned the rationale uh, about earlier on. Uh, 121 were assigned to lap sleeve and 119 to run Y. To cut a long story short, they end up with 102 patients at 10 year in uh, the lap uh, sleeve and um, 95 in the Rue and Y. Uh, they managed to include in the final analysis 98 versus 95. So a pretty good um, follow-up at 10 years, I would say. Uh, worth mentioning here, uh, particularly towards the, the final part of, of the chart, is that a reasonable amount, about 20 plus percent of um, lap sleeves were actually converted either to a Rue and Y or a SADI. Um, either for inadequate weight loss on one side or for uh, predominantly um, gastros gastroesophageal reflux related issues. Um, so uh, let's have a look at the table um, that uh, illustrates the uh, baseline characteristics of the two groups. And as you can see, um, they're pretty similar, uh, both in terms of gender distribution, age, um, original weight, original BMI, and comorbidities distribution. Um, so ball to you, uh, Alistair, for a bit more. So, yeah, um, the primary outcome uh, they were looking at, as I mentioned previously, is this excess weight loss. And they did identify, as you can see there, a sort of marginal benefit in the gold standard brew on Y compared to the gastric sleeve in this excess weight loss after 10 years, which is quite nicely demonstrated by these um, graphs here. The sort of cementing the brew on Y as the gold standard um, in terms of the uh, the excess weight loss, and then they identified this, as you can see here, as it was a statistically significant difference. So in terms of just based on a weight loss outcome, they did identify the rule on why as superior. And then Joe's going to talk us a little bit about the secondary outcomes that they found. Yes, so um, we didn't um, put down a specific numbers um, for the purposes of time, but to cut a long story short, the authors did not detect a statistically significant difference between the two procedures in terms of type 2 diabetes remission, uh, dyslipidemia, or ulcerative sleep apnea. Uh, hypertension was um, remission was slightly superior um, in the RNY group. Um, it is worth mentioning that, to my view, the results that they have are 
um, a little bit below what I was sold when these procedures were kind of becoming more and more popular um, 10 years ago. Uh, and, um, but you know, you get what you get. And um, in terms of quality of life, the two groups are pretty much equivalent at 10 years, and they both uh, luckily had a significant better quality of life compared to baseline. Uh, why would you otherwise subject yourself to a procedure that uh, carries a risk of dying, although a small risk of dying? Um, major complications, which are in this particular case classed as um, clavian dindor type 4 complications, uh, predominantly um, revisional surgery, were 19 in the lap sleeve and 22 in the Roux-en-Y. Um, the vast majority of, of sleeve gastrectomy-related reintervention were associated with uh, gastrotophageal reflux, and they were predominantly conversion to a Roux-en-Y. Um, and the vast majority of, of reinterventions after uh, uh, lap Roux-en-Y were uh, for internal hernias. Uh, Ball to you, Alistair, for a bit more. Yeah, so... Um... The, so this is one of the, the sort of reflective conclusions they drew uh, retroactively, as I mentioned. The esophagite is more present in the um, uh, gastric sleeve, and it was significantly more. It was 31% um, versus 7%. This was found on uh, – this wasn't patient reported. Obviously, this was found on uh, actual uh, OGDs that all the patients were uh, were given. That was higher, but there was no statistical significantly different statistical significant difference in the presentation of new of de novo Barrett's. Um, the other important thing which I've written there is all the Barrett's esophagus, all the de novo Barrett's they identified was short segment. Um, so it's not so, something that we obviously clinically nothing we'd arrange formal follow up for anyway. Um, so you know that's something worth taking into account as to whether that was anything of clinical significance, um, but there was no difference between the two procedures anyway, despite the significant increase in esophagitis in those with gastric sleeves. So this is just a brief summary of what we what we um, mentioned uh, so far. Um, point number one, um, excess weight loss is superior uh, in laparoscopic Renoir. Um, there's a superior hypertension remission in lapro and Y. Other comorbidities seems to be pretty much equivalent in the two groups. And as vaginitis is obviously more prevalent post lap sleeve. So let's move on to some limitations, Alistair. Yeah. So the uh, the self-reported limitations, the limitations they identified, one was uh, 10 years ago, so this 2000, approximately between 2010 and 2012, there were fairly limited bariatric procedures being performed in Finland at all. Um, so there, you know, the three centers that they used, the three hospitals that they used, um, the, the sort of novel aspect and the, the sort of underperformance compared to the international community may have impacted perhaps not the quality, but certainly perhaps the, uh, demographic of patients they looked at. The other was the variable, variable definition of Barrett's, uh, esophagus and sort of the esophag esophagitis that they identified they were both seen on um uh on gastroscopy but it was their presence or their absence they weren't necessarily specifically defined as uh you know a particular length uh, moving up the esophagus as an example or um or you know for example biopsies taken um of of all different patients so they identified Barrett's in presence, but um, severity of Barrett's and both suffragitis wasn't necessarily looked into that significantly, um, which brings on there. So the standardized sort of reflux disease assessment, again, it was presence or absence. It wasn't severity. And then the limited trial size, the 240 patients they started with, obviously, um, they reflected on in the study itself as something that was limiting them. But um, Gio is going to speak to us about some of the limitations that we identified. Yeah, just a few more. So um, as you can probably guess, uh, there is, I feel that there is a degree of halo effect in all this. Um, you know, these patients are followed up by pretty much their own surgeons. Um, obviously, there is no blinding uh, in all of this. is an open level trial. So, um, the follow-up is probably a bit tighter. There's probably a lower threshold and start starting PPIs compared to uh, a normal population of bariatric patients. And furthermore, uh, I do think that the same reasons that trigger this particular um, 
secondary outcome investigation, aka doing an additional OGD at 10 years to check for um, all these complications of reflux, paradoxically also prompted a more aggressive treatment of these potential complications before the OGD in, uh, um, in lab sleeve patients. So the surgeons does know that there is a risk of this, so they treat it more aggressively. Um, timing of PPI prescription and endoscopic assessment is not clear. And you know, if you're treating someone, if you identify an esophagitis, uh, you give them PPIs. And then generally, if you have ulcerations, you check it again. Obviously, if you've given them PPI to start with before your uh, 10 years endoscopic assessment, that does uh, reduce the uh, prevalence of esophagitis to a certain extent. Um, I guess the authors do spend some time talking about um, how many patients they would need to include uh, to define, um, to, to prove a statistically significant difference between lap pro -NY and lap sleeve in terms of comorbidities. Um, I guess if we are worried about Barrett's esophagus and we were to decide, because it's a precancerous condition, to design a trial to identify whether there's a difference between these two procedures, what would be the threshold to define the two procedures equivalent? What difference would we accept given that one could give an increased risk of a precancerous condition? Would it be zero? Would it be 2%? I don't know. Um, as we mentioned earlier on uh, during um, the presentation, uh, a lot of patients get converted from a lap sleeve to a Rouen Y. Um, and predominantly that's because of gastrointestinal reflux symptoms. Um, <clears throat> I guess that group of patients will probably be treated differently in different situations in different countries. The threshold for operating will be different. Um, and again, the protocol deviation that that does generate hits up to about 20%, which I feel is quite a lot. And obviously patients that have been converted from sleeve to Rouen Y will have less Barrett's, will have less esophagitis, or at least that's rational. Um, so, Bol, back to you, Alistair, for some conclusions. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, broadly speaking, at 10 years, uh, they did identify, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that the percentage excess weight loss was greater in the room Y compared to the gastric sleeve. One of the interesting conclusions they drew is the Barrett's esophagus incidence, which we mentioned, I mentioned earlier, that was statistically significant, was a, a slight outlier conclusion in this study. In other similar studies, where they've looked at specifically Barrett's esophagus incidence comparing gastric sleeves to other procedures, gastric sleeves have resulted in significantly higher incidence of Barrett's esophagus. And the fact that they were equal in this two, in in, in these in these in this study, is interesting. Although it's worth noting that the esophagitis incidence was more than four times um in in the uh gastric sleeve in the room why so perhaps a further you know a, a longer study than 10 years would result in similar findings to other studies in terms of the the sort of um the, the positives and negatives we sort of sum up summed up what we've spoken about there uh in in the table at the bottom there um which I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to run through, but uh, Gio, did you have anything to say about the conclusions we'd come to at the bottom in the table? No, not particularly. I think uh, we've covered pretty much everything. Mm. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. That's, that's us. As usual, a brief summary of what we discussed um, after the paper presentation. Uh, we looked back at the original design of this trial, uh, which, as mentioned in the presentation, is designed as an equivalence trial. And we couldn't help but ask ourselves why this particular type of design was chosen. Uh, it appears reading through the paper that the authors clearly had in mind um, some intrinsic advantages associated with sleeve gastrectomy as it does not require an anastomosis. It's a quicker procedure and it does cost less money. Um, therefore we wondered whether a non-inferiority design would have been preferred. We could not really find an answer uh, looking at the previous publication concerning the sleeve pass trial itself. Uh, we then carried on asking ourselves and discussing a few of the questions that uh, we highlighted during the presentation, particularly in association with the halo effect, 
the onset use of PPIs in comparison to the time of assessment at 10 years, as well as what could be described as protocol deviation associated with conversion of sleeve gastrectomies to ruin my gastric bypasses. Uh, we'll pose all the questions to the authors and uh, we'll keep you posted. I'll leave you to Prof Saba presentation. So uh, we've been talking about um, evidence-based practice um, or for, on a few occasions, and I think we, we were focusing on the first two steps in evidence-based practice, which is asking the right clinical questions, and the second is acquiring evidence, how we acquire evidence. And um, I've done a few talks on these. Uh, and I was thinking that we should just go back to this PICO uh, framework, uh, because we had a few issues when we were recently discussing a paper with some students in Leicester, when we were struggling to apply the PICO format uh, for the um, studies that they were critiquing. So I thought we should just go back to the PICO uh, framework explain what it is, um, why we need this framework, what the limitations are with the PICO framework, and what are some of the variants. So it's just a few slides, so hopefully it shouldn't be too long. So to recap, I guess um, you guys uh, know and have heard of the PICO framework. So the P stands for population, which is the patient group that is a subject of the uh, question. Um, I is intervention that is being considered, C is comparator or control, and O is the um, outcome of interest, or at least one of the main outcomes of interest. So essentially, this framework is used to frame a clinical question, uh, or a re research question for that matter. So if you have a patient uh, that uh, has a specific problem and you're wondering about a particular intervention, um, so as to reduce the risk of a, uh, uh, an outcome you're interested in, um, then you think about uh, the question in the form of a PICO, right? So if you've got that PICO um, framework sorted, then you can use the PICO framework to then formulate a search strategy. So essentially, uh, you define the concepts based on the PICO, and then use the appropriate keywords, and we talked about this in one of our previous um, introduction to EBM talks. And you also use the PICO framework to uh, appraise a research paper, as you guys have just done. So these are the um, uh, these are essentially the uses of uh, uh, the PICO framework. So the paper that we've just discussed, um, where you compare laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy versus a ruin Y gastric bypass in um, um, adult patients with significant obesity, looking at uh, specific outcomes. So let's try and work out what the PICO is. So the population is obviously adult patients with obesity. And as you have done, uh, we probably need a lot more detail to clearly explain you know, what this population is uh, to the listener. So uh, you will need detail on eligibility criteria. You need to say what you mean by adults, uh, what are the um, age cutoffs, You'd need to say how you define obesity, and you'd also need to say, you know, what kind of filters you uh, would apply uh, to an uh, obese adult patient who is being subjected to surgery. And then uh, intervention uh, here is a laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, and just stating what the intervention uh, is um, alone is usually not sufficient. Uh, we need a lot of detail on the methodology, and the reason we need um, the details on uh, um, the methods or how the intervention is actually implemented is to be able to assess um, you know, how uh, this can be applied in other settings. Similarly, for the control, and the control here is laparoscopic ruin Y gastric bypass, you need details on how the bypass is actually done. And then the outcome um, in this study, uh, we've said I've heard the outcome was percentage um, excess weight loss. So you need to think about what this is, how this is defined, as Alistair explained to us, um, and then that kind of definition and how you assess the weight loss uh, is really important so that other people can go and reproduce um, uh, this uh, kind of study. And also you can then, uh, if you have insight into how the outcome was assessed, then you can compare different studies that have assessed this particular outcome. 
Right. So what are the problems then? Um, what are the issues in using the PICO framework for clinical questions in general? Sometimes in some specific situations, you might want to place a lot of emphasis on certain other considerations, like, for example, time. So in certain clinical questions, uh, it may be important to consider, uh, say, the duration of treatment. If it's an ongoing treatment for considerable lengths of time, then you might want to say that the treatment was employed for three years or five years or longer. In some other um, clinical questions, uh, what might be important is time to the outcome. Like, for example, in this particular study we've discussed, we were looking at expected weight loss over 10 years. So um, if you're able to present uh, right at the outset within the framework time to outcome, then that might be um, quite useful. Another consideration that might be useful to add to the PICO is the type of study. So uh, in other words, study design. We talked about study design before. So it will be useful to specify whether the study is a randomized controlled trial or a cohort study or a case control study. So what some of the EBM enthusiasts have suggested is that we add these T's to the PICO. So we've got a PICO TT, um, one T is for time, the other T is for type of study. So um, I think that's a, it's a good um, thing to do. Uh, so when you're describing a study, when you're summarizing a study, um, in addition to PICO, if you think about these additional considerations, then that's quite helpful. Now, PICO was initially described as a valuable sort of tool um, for studies or questions that apply to treatment. That was the initial intent. But as you know, clinical questions fall into many other categories. And, then, uh, and the question then was whether PICO applies equally well to the other categories. So looking at the other categories, one of the categories is prevention, prevention questions, you know, the, this abstinence from smoking reduce post-operative wound infection. That's a classic prevention question. Now, um, for prevention questions as well, PICO uh, works um, quite well because the I in PICO, that stands for intervention, uh, we're not specifying whether the intervention um, is therapeutic or preventative. At the end of the day, it is an intervention that aims to change the natural history of a particular problem. And therefore, for prevention questions, PICO works quite well. The next category of questions would be questions relating to risk, risk of a particular disease or prognosis, and observational studies in general. Now, obviously, in risk and prognosis studies, you do not have any intervention, but you have what we call exposure. So um, it can be quite straightforward in that you simply swap um, exposure instead of the intervention. And let's say you're looking at uh, smoking and bowel cancer, for example, you know, your smoking would be your exposure, people who don't smoke would be the controls, and the occurrence of bowel cancer would be the outcome. Now, there are many studies, or you might have a question where you say, I would like to know the prognosis of stage four bowel cancer. And in, that's a very valid clinical question. And if you want to answer that, then obviously you cannot apply the PICO format because there's no ex, uh, exposure or, and comparator, but you just have the population and the outcome. And that, that's um, um, uh, quite uh, easy to do, relatively straightforward to do. What about other questions? Now, diagnostic questions are a problem. Let's take an example. So if, for example, you're interested in knowing what the diagnostic utility of CRP in appendicitis is, um, let's think about how you can apply uh, the PICO framework. Now, you could say that um, patients with suspend, suspected appendicitis would be your patient group or your population. CRP would be your intervention. It's not really an intervention, but you could assume that. And you could have no CRP or white cell count as your control or comparator, and your outcome could be whether appendicitis um, is the final diagnosis or not. Some other people suggest for these examples that you uh, adopt a slightly different um, strategy um, of using the PICO framework. And this strategy is probably well suited for case control studies. So these are studies where you already have the outcome 
um, and then you stratify patients as to whether they had appendicitis or, or did not have appendicitis. So that would be your population. So population will have two groups. One would have had established uh, appendicitis or the diagnosis would have been secured by some other gold standard test. And another group would be people without appendicitis. The intervention and comparator are uh, uh, similar, are the same as before. In other words, uh, CRP would be your intervention and white cell count would be your comparator. And the outcome here would be a diagnostic test parameter like sensitivity, specificity, predictive values, and so on. Okay, so it's a slightly artificial situation, but this is another way of using the PICO framework. People have suggested an alternative term. You may come across this term, so I've got this um, in the screen. So people call it the PTSD framework, some people. So P is the population, T is the test, which is CRP here, and S is a standard, which is probably the white cell count, and D is a diagnostic test parameter. Okay, so just in case you come across the PTSD framework for diagnostic studies, um, you, you uh, um, have heard it before. Now, there are many other very valid clinical questions, foreground questions, where the PICO format simply does not apply. And I've got some examples on the screen, economic studies, qualitative studies, and mechanistic studies. So, so that's a problem. And the other, there are some other um, issues with uh, PICO, and I'll just run through a few examples. And I'll cite a paper which has explored this in a bit of detail, and you might be interested. So the first thing is sometimes the original question um, can get lost in your attempt to put the question in a PICO format. For example, let's say you've got a patient with a liver abscess and you're thinking, what's the most effective treatment for liver abscess? And in your mind, you're thinking whether antibiotics is the, is the best way forward or antibiotics with drainage or maybe an operation. So you've got all of these things in your mind. And if you try and um, enforce a PICO model, you might end up in uh, formulating a question wherein you're simply comparing drainage with surgery, for example, or drainage with antibiotics, as opposed to all the possible options. So, um, so in that uh, situation, what happens is once you've um, uh, done your PICO framework and you're doing the searches, you might find it difficult to reconstruct the original question. Right, the second problem, or sorry, another problem, what's happened here? Right, another problem is that um, when you enforce a PICO framework, you often make the assumption that the relationships are causal. What does that mean? Let's consider an example. So let's take uh, the relationship between obesity and say infection after appendicectomy. Now, if you try and consider this as a risk study and use the PICO format, you are making the assumption that obesity um, is probably causally related to postoperative infection. Where, whereas actually it may well be the case that the, um, the person who is morbidly obese may have a higher chance of actually undergoing an open appendicectomy or a lap converter to open appendicectomy than if he or she were not morbidly obese. And it could be that the open approach is associated with a high risk of infection and that obesity per se does not contribute to infection. Yeah, so I hope that, um, uh, this example is clear. So what we're saying here is that you could enforce a PICO format to try and address this question that is looking at the relationship between obesity and infection, but you may um, end up assuming um, that the relationships are causal when they may not be. Right, so what about temporally related questions? So let's say there's a question that says, um, what's the optimum interval for screening in Barrett's esophagus? So in Bar Barrett's esophagus, we do endoscopy to look for esophageal cancer. We do that uh, every so often. It might be annually or biannually or whatever. And if you're interested in the optimum interval, um, and that's what you want to find, and you want to go and search the literature or do a study, then you're going to struggle to put this into a PICO format. 
you might have to make some assumptions. You might say, look, I'm, I probably will look into comparing uh, one year screening versus biannual screening and, and look at long term prognosis or something like that. Finally, and that there is a significant problem in applying PICO to background questions. So we talked about background questions and foreground questions before, and here's a classic example of a background question. So what are the ways in which a recurrent pilonidal sinus can be treated? Uh, surgical, non-surgical, the various, uh, various types of surgery, and that would be a background question, and PICO for, um, frameworks would be difficult to apply. Right, so here is the link if you wanted to um, uh, look at this in a bit more detail. So to summarize, we talk about what PICO is. Um, and I've said that PICO is essentially used to frame a clinical question. And then you can use that framework to develop an appropriate search strategy if you're gonna search the literature to get the answer to your question. And also, as we've done uh, today, PICO uh, framework helps to appraise a paper. There are a number of limitations. Essentially, uh, you've got to remember that it's a little bit difficult to apply PICO uh, directly to some situations, especially situations um, around non-treatment questions, and also questions on background and some study designs, observation study designs, and, and particularly case control studies. And I mentioned a few variants of PICO. We've got the PICO TT, we've got the PECO, that's for observation studies, and we've got the PTSD for diagnostic studies. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep ramming your life with our surgical podcast. <laughs>